to Bellman's for church worship this morning, and we want to welcome Reverend Kevin McLemore, who will be leading our worship today. Pastor McLemore is the Associate Conference Minister for Search and Call in the Pennsylvania Southeast Conference of the UCC. He's sitting over there. Please remember that next Sunday is a very important Sunday for us. We have our pastoral candidate trial sermon and vote next Sunday, and you must be present to vote, so please bring your friends who are church members, and we need everybody here to hear the wonderful uh, sermon. He's, well, the whole, he's going to be doing the whole service and communion, so please be here to welcome him. Um, this week is VBS week. We will be the meeting Monday through Thursday evening at the Fellowship Hall from 6 to 8. Are there any additional comments? Okay, I have one. We're reminding everybody, again, please, if you have flowers or if you have bulletins, there are forms just like this right next to the charts for the flowers and the bulletins. I checked it this morning and there's quite a few names on there, unfortunately, not the people who are, it's people who are missing, that we have, James or I have no information. So we don't know, other than your name is there, we don't know what you want the flowers or the bulletins for. So a reminder, don't forget to do these papers. Um, any additions or corrections to today's prayer list? Okay, seeing none, we may rise, please, for the gathering hymn. <laughs>
friends, please be seated. I ask you to invite, to invite you to join me in the liturgy as printed in your bulletin this morning. We gather in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to praise. One generation shall praise your works to another. And all, shall your all your works praise you, O Lord. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and Amen. Friends, let us pray. Let our repentant prayers ascend to you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with purified hearts and minds we may sing your praise and glorify your name forever. Holy and gracious God, I confess that I have sinned against you and my neighbor. Some sins I know, the thoughts, words, and deeds of which I am ashamed, but some are known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask forgiveness. Deliver me and restore me, that I may live in everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grants you pardon, forgiveness, and a remission of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, thanks be to God. Friends, the peace of the Lord be with you all. Please share a sign of peace with one another. God, you have placed within the hearts of all your children a longing for your word and a hunger for your truth. Grant that we may know your Son to be the true bread of heaven and share this bread with all the world through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
Good morning. Good morning. First reading is from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 to 44. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elijah said, Give it to the people and let them eat. But his servant said, How can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, Give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. He said it before them, and they ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. Read responsibly Psalm 145, verses 10 to 18. All your work shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. To make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways, and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, and to all who call on him in truth. The second reading is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. For this reason I bow my knees to before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of glory, he may grant that you may strengthen in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus and all generations forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. The reading is from John 6, 1 through 21. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the, what he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up to the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. And when he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, and Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test them, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? And Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had, been given, he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. And so they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. And when the people saw the sign that what he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, 
and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. And then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land towards where they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Friends, please be seated. Do we have any children here today? All right, folks. I think I'm going to walk and talk now. So there's this jingle something offering going on, right? You're raising money for Bear Creek Camp. I'm going to do my children's message. We probably do need some folks to help pass along the, the, uh, the offering buckets, quite literally the offering buckets. Thank you, guys. assume that I get 10% of whatever that was given today. <laughs> Preacher's always looking. All right, my friends, it's good to be here. I have to tell you, when um, I grew up in, I grew up in a non-religious family, and uh, it was interesting to start off the service with just as I am. But when I became a Christian at 13, I, I asked my parents, what are we? And my parents were very non-religious, and she said, I think we're Baptists. So I started going to the Baptist church. And just as I am, if you know anything about the tradition, is that it's always at the end of the service. It's always at that moment when you're asking people to come and meet the Lord for the first time or rededicate their lives. And so I think in the history of my, even though I was Baptist only about six years, I think I've sung just as I am the most because it was one of three hymns that were used to ask people to come down and receive the Lord. So I should know it by heart. I should know it by heart. Friends, I bring you greetings from the 148 churches of our conference and the staff of the Pennsylvania Southeast Conference of the United Church of Christ. The conference, like the Synod, is that link that connects our church's various and diverse ministries, both locally and globally, and together in our best moments, we provide our local congregations and pastors uh, with the training and inspiration they need to carry out our church's wider mission, OCWM. The truth of the matter is that Christianity is not a solo religion. It is not a religion practiced by yourself in some room somewhere. It's a religion of community. And so we are always stronger together, right? Therefore, we embrace diversity. We don't always have to agree with each other. We embrace, above all, love. And we share the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ. 
My name is Kevin McLemore, and I am again the Associate Minister of Conference, Associate Conference Minister for Search and Call. And I've been kind of working with your transition team, along with my very uh, beloved colleague, the Rachel, uh, the Reverend Rachel Dietz of the Lutheran Church. I want to say, I, I, for those of you who don't know, in the United Church of Christ, at least in the Penn Southeast Conference, we have about 20 churches that are in your situation. You are doubly blessed, right? You have connections to two different traditions which also gives you the blessing of having the resources of two different denominations. So kudos to you and to the other 19 churches in our conference that have a dual affiliation, mostly with the Lutherans, though there are a few with the Presbyterians and other settings as well with the Disciples of Christ. <clears throat> I am so excited for you that you will be hopefully calling a new pastor next week if the vote goes well, and may God bless you as you journey now with your pastor, who I know very well, and he's a good man, and I'm so glad and happy that it seems like a great match for you. So today I wanted to dig a little deeper into the text from the letter to the Ephesians and this interesting ode to the death of God's love for us. And I do this, of course, as you likely begin a new chapter in your long storied history with a new pastor, right? As a congregation, you are not as young as this congregation who received this letter from Paul. They perhaps had been in existence for 20, 25 years, right? At the best, they are, as the saying goes, a kind of a new church start, composed seemingly of a set of believers that Paul focused much of his ministry on, which of course is the Gentiles, those who were non-Jews before they became Christians. And you've learned many of those lessons of what it means to be church in your 278 years of existence. It's a lot of people, a lot of proclamations, a lot of sermons, a lot of life together. Now, these are lessons that you've had in those years that the church in Ephesus was just beginning to learn. And I think you can sense that in our text today. Throughout Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, Paul is reminding them over and over again that they are one in Christ and that they should seek unity together as a congregation. But, of course, if you're encouraging the Ephesians to recognize the truth of the oneness in the body of Christ, now that means that they have found themselves divided by something, and Paul knows about it. Of course, the New Testament letters are full of writers responding to congregations who were immersed in one controversy or another. It may not be a great comfort to us, but as long as there have been churches all the way back to the New Testament churches, as we can see in the letters, you've had church fights. And yet, I've never been bothered by that harsh reality because I often think in those moments of conflict, that is when we learn how to love each other. Years ago, I had a friend, um, when I had just begun my ministry, I was doing this new church star in Oklahoma City, a friend from my college days emailed me to ask if I could write a letter of recommendation for his application to seminary. Now, I have to tell you, I was surprised that John, which is not his real name, was thinking about seminary or serving the church as a pastor because I had never known him to be much of a churchgoer, and we had never discussed this. And of course, he knew from then, we knew each other pretty well, despite him knowing that I had felt to be called to the church, serve the church as a pastor since I was 16 or so. It was the first couple of years of my ministry, and when I received this request from him, and again, I was working on that new church start in Oklahoma City. And folks, planning a church is really, really hard. right? I know maintaining a church is hard, but starting one, far harder. At least it was for me. The church was growing, but with a new body of believers, there were challenges as we learned how to love each other, all of us getting to know each other at the same time. You don't have the kind of history and a new church start that you have here. Now, I responded to John about that letter out of some frustration, right? So I asked him why he felt called to ministry. Why did he love, what did he love about the church? He responded by writing that he loved the beauty of the church building. And this is a beautiful church building. That's really beautiful. Loved all this, right? He loved the challenge or the beauty of the liturgy and... You know, just all the stuff. He wrote, you know, pageantry of the worship service. He wanted to be a, an Episcopal priest, an Anglican priest, which, of course, is you, if you've been to an Episcopal service, it's like a Catholic service, very ornate, very... If you're into liturgy, it's what you'll love, right? He wanted to become that kind of priest, hence the focus on the beauty of the liturgy from his perspective. And I... So I received this reply, and as much as I appreciate the buildings, and I do appreciate that, if you've ever not 
when you start a church, you don't have a building. So you really appreciate having one when you're sort of in the midst of trying to build up a church, right? And I love beautiful worship service. I noticed that there was something clearly missing in his words, which is the actual people of God, the people of the church. I wrote back, and I know I wrote back a bit tersely than I should have, and I pointed out the missing element in what he had wrote, that being, of course, you, me, the people of God. And I told them that I believe that if you don't have that fundamental love for God's people as a minister, he would be out of ministry, ministry in a few years. There are moments, I wrote, when you find yourself at some church team meeting and you've been arguing about where to plant the new shrubbery around the church or arguing about the color of the carpet and you are thinking, are you kidding me? The kingdom of God has come to this? That we are arguing, sometimes treating each other badly because of the color of the carpet. Really? John, if you can't come out of those meetings I wrote and still somehow love God's people, still have hope, then ministry is not for you. So he never applied for seminary, never became a minister. I don't know if what I said made any difference. He certainly didn't reply back. Sorry. We're friends. It's okay. He's a wonderful school teacher, actually, who now lives in New Zealand, and I am happy for him. That is his calling. So you have this new church in what is now the country of Turkey, the church at Ephesus, and they don't have the memory muscle of what it means to walk with each other in the ways and the following the ways of Jesus. Just like my church start didn't, right? The point in my back and forth with my friend about his supposed call to ministry was something I couldn't quite articulate back then, but as 27 years later, now I can. And that is that the whole point of gathering together, doing this on a Sunday morning, with intention, not by accident, to walk and worship beside each other in a church, the whole point of this is to learn how to love God and learn how to love one another. That's the point. What are the two greatest commandments teacher Jesus taught us? Love God and love each other. And it's important that even in our text today, everything that Paul points to here in chapter 3 of Ephesians, the boldness given to him by the Spirit to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, he said it is, must be, must be grounded in love, rooted in love. God's love and our love for each other. So what do 1 Corinthians chapter 13 say? Remember that famous chapter about love? Which echoes what has been written today. You can have hope, you can have faith, and you can have love. But the greatest of these is love. You can have great faith in Jesus Christ. But if you don't have love, he says, you have nothing. What does Paul write here in our text today? Christ may dwell in your heart in faith, but it must be somehow rooted in love. Here Paul points to the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. To be full of God is to be full of love. To be full of God is to be full of love. And the way we learn how to show that love first given to us is, at least partially, is this odd thing we call the church. The truth of the matter is that the church is the only place in our lives where the focus is simply on love. Being loved by God, loving God, and loving each other. Now certainly, the love of God is the reason why we gather this morning. The way we learn how to love God is by learning how to love each other. Remember the two, again, those two great commandments that Jesus teaches. They're a paired set. He doesn't talk about loving God, and then in chapters later talk about loving each other. He pairs the commandments together. Love God and love one another. To love another person is to love God and to love God is to love another person. This community, and me and others like it, there are places where you intentionally gather to learn the lessons of love, and though we may learn some of those lessons in other parts of our lives, like within our families, or at the Kiwanis Club, it is only the church where human beings intentionally show up 
to learn how to love God and love each other. You may love to learn your brothers and sisters in Kiwanis Club or any other setting. That's a good thing. But that Kiwanis don't exist to teach us how to love one another. The church does. It does fundamentally. And also this. You know, and I like our families, we choose church. We choose to learn how to love in places like this. It's about sticking around with the argument about the color of the carpet has reached an absurd level. And you really are saying, really? Really? And acknowledging that even in those moments of great contention, sometimes over nothing, just really nothing, we are even then learning how to love one another. And I want to make this clear. I didn't say like each other. Right? That's a different thing. I said love each other. I, can't, I don't have to like someone to love them. Which means if they are a Samaritan on the side of the road, I stop. Don't like them. Don't believe what they believe. Different politics. Different understandings of faith. But loving each other says, I disagree with you, and I think you're really wrong, and you need help with that tire. Because I'm here for you. That's what love is. Right? It, again, at 1 Corinthians reminds us, love is a doing. If you look at that chapter very carefully, there's not a lot of talk about feelings. It's about doing something. Feelings come and go. But love remains when the warm feelings have deserted us long ago. And we just simply choose to love someone by doing the right thing by each other. Again, I'm going to say, the church is the only place in our lives where we show up to learn how to love, to love God, to love each other, and to experience the love of Christ while walking beside each other. Now, Paul's wish for the church in Ephesus in our text today is that we would know deep in their hearts, that they would know deep in their hearts, the fullness and depth of God's love for them, right? These imperfect disciples of Jesus of Nazareth, people just like us. We may have more years into being the church than the church at Ephesus, right? And my new church started in the year 2000. But the truth is, those lessons around love are not just for churches who are now just beginning their life together. This journey towards love, loving God, loving each other, learning the depth of God's love for us and all humankind, and ultimately everyone, that is something your church began to do a long time ago. You've had practice. You've had practice. But you're still learning, as we all are, even now. To know the depth and breadth of that kind of love takes a long time. And even then, we will never quite know fully the depth of God's love for us. At least not on this side of eternity. Now, sometimes I would say, the enormity of that love we learn about here, and the, in the love we're commanded to practice with each other, can seem almost impossible. How many of us have seen people leave? Sometimes rightfully, sometimes because they needed to, to take care of their souls and their selves. But to realize it felt like at times we failed to love well, right? Can, it almost can seem ridiculous what is asked of us, right? Too much to be asked to learn about the depth of God's love and then be asked to do the same, which is to love God and love each other and do the harder commandment, which of course is to love one another. It's kind of easy to love God. It's much easier, much harder to love one another. There's a short fiction story said in the early part of the last century by the author Wendell Berry. Anybody read Wendell Berry? Read Wendell Berry. He's one of the great authors of our age. He happens to be a Christian. His works are not overly Christian, but you can see gospel stuff in there. Tells the tale of two friends who have known each other since they were children. Thad and Matt are good friends. But Thad struggles with the drink, as they say, right? And one day, while Thad is on another bender in their small downtown in Kentucky, his friend Matt angrily tells him to go home and rest. This enrages Thad, who feels humiliated by his best friend, who did this publicly. And in a moment of rage, Thad shoots and kills Matt. The narrator is being told this story by, narrator is being told this story by his grandmother, and she describes it the following. 
The sheriff opened the cell door and stood aside to let her in. Martha Elizabeth, that is, Thad's daughter. I'll come back after a while, he said. The door closed and was locked behind her, and she stood still until Thad felt her presence and looked up. When he recognized her, he covered his faith with both hands, his faith, face with both hands. He put his hands over his face like a man ashamed, my grandmother said. But he was like a man, too, who had seen what he could not bear. My grandmother sat without speaking a moment, for she had much to ask of me. Maybe Thad saw his guilt full and clear then, but what he saw that he couldn't bear was something else. And again, she paused looking at me. She said, finally, people sometimes talk of God's love as if it's a pleasant thing, but it is terrible in a way. Think all of it includes, think all of, think all of it includes. It included Thad, drunk and mean and foolish, before he killed Matt, and it included him afterwards. That's what Thad saw. He saw his guilt. He had killed his friend. He had done what he could not undo. He had destroyed what he could not make. But in the same moment, he saw his guilt included in love that stood as near to him as Martha Elizabeth. And at that moment, that love wore her flesh. It was surely weak and wrong of Thad to kill himself later in that jail cell, to sit in judgment that way over himself. But surely God's love includes the people who can't bear it. She still had more to tell, but she paused again, and again she looked at me and touched my hand. If God loves the ones we can't, she said, then finally maybe we can. All these years I thought of him sitting in those shadows with, Mom, with, with Martha Elizabeth standing there and his work sore old hands over his face. The truth of it is that we almost always have to learn of God's deep and wide and simply outrageous and unreasonable love for us through others. Through people like Martha Elizabeth. Through moments when grace and love is offered to us when it was not deserved and it was not merited. Sometimes that is too much for some of us. Think of Thad in the story. He cannot bear that love would include him even after the hurt he has caused Matt's family and his own family. As I said earlier, the church is the only place we come together simply to learn how to love God and love each other. And yet it is also a place where we also come to learn how to be loved. Loved by God and loved by each other. I know there are all sorts of stories in this church, right? As in every church, every one that I've ever pastored, and I assume this place, when some of us were not kind or loving to each other, and where struggles about carpet colors had nothing to do with the color of anything in the end. But some deeper, unnamed struggle between people called to love each other, but who have found it hard to do at times. How are I want to point out something here, right? You've had practice, decades and decades of practice, unlike the church at Ephesus, to learn what the grandmother says in the stories. If God loves the ones we can't, then maybe we can. It all started with God's love for us, to know the breadth and length and the height and depth of that love, and then passing it on to each other, hard as that might be at times. You've got a new shepherd, hopefully, coming in to lead you in a few weeks, and he'll be guiding you in that work of love in new ways. But you know how to do it. You know how to do it, if imperfectly, like all churches. So may the coming years be a blessing, and may you continue the work of knowing God's love and returning that love back to God, and, of course, giving it back to each other. Amen. Friends, I invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of life together. May you bless our times together. Remind us of how deeply we are loved and our call to love you and to love each other.
In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, join me in the Apostles' Creed as printed in your bulletin this morning. In response to hearing God's word for us, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Receive this morning's offering. I assume, is it given in the back or do ushers come forward? They come forward. All right. Friends, I just want to remind you of something. You know, I, I think oftentimes churches, churches I pastor, think of the offering as just this moment where we collect money. It's something that has to happen, right? Some ways we have to support all this. Uh, me, others, right? But in the end, it's that weird moment that a service really probably isn't complete without an offering because of this. It's that one time in the service we acknowledge that everything we have ever been given, including all the hard work we were able to do in this world, is a gift from God. It has always been a gift. And in the service, in this moment, whatever is dollar, $5,000, we acknowledge in that moment and we return back to God what was first given to us. Friends, I ask the ushers to come forward and receive this morning's offering.
Friends, please be seated. I invite you to quiet your hearts as we go before God in prayer together as community. Living and gracious God, we thank you for the ways that you greet us in this world, the ways you meet us on the byways and the highways and, of course, in a place like this. Thank you for surprising us, for calling us into wonder, for sometimes even scolding us. You have been a God who has been faithful. You have not walked away. You did not run away. You stayed. And for that, we thank you and praise you and give you honor. We thank you for all the ways that you continue to heal us. And we pray for those in need of healings like Bailey and Missy and Brian, George and Karen and Oliver, for Jim, Keith, Richard and Paul, for Kelly and Douglas and Peyton, Richard and June, Mark and Elaine, Leona, Judy, Grace, Ron, Joe, Maya, Nancy and Janet, for Dennis and Joyce, Dennis and Carolyn, Shirley, Berger, Mandy, Carol and Rex, Macon, Bill, Kim and Abby, Abby, Donald, Mildred and Easton. Gracious God, you are God who meets us in resurrection in our healing and our wholeness, and you are God who meets us in crucifixion. You meet us all in all spaces in between those moments in our lives. We thank you for your faithfulness. Be with those who are in need of healing. Be with those who serve our country. Be with this country and every country. Remind us over and over again that you indeed are the light of the world. And in this moment, we acknowledge that. Indeed, at some point, you said we might need words. That even then you were gracious and loving and kind. And when words desert us, you gave us a prayer to pray. So we go together before you and pray the Lord's Prayer. Please rise as you're able. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved of God, you have been healed and forgiven. God has blessed you with a steadfast love in which we find peace. The peace of God will always be with you. Thank you.
Friends, go in peace and serve the Lord.